Some people think that they are above the law. You know the type, born into money, never done an honest day's work in their life. A spoilt toddler that has grown in years but not in behaviour. Some people believe they can get away with anything, but in the case of Yardley Love, will consequences finally come knocking at her assailant's door? Or will he simply walk free? Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Join the quickly growing Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and make sure you turn on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Yardley and all those affected by this dark case. Yardley Love was born on July the 17th, 1987. She grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, with her parents John and Sharon, and to all intents and purposes, she had a wonderful childhood. Her family was wealthy and she wanted for nothing. She attended an all-girls private school called Notre Dame Prep. There, she joined the varsity lacrosse and field hockey teams, and in 2006, she was an all-country lacrosse player. She went on to go to the University of Virginia. There she majored in political science and minored in Spanish. Of course, she also joined the university's lacrosse team. And it was there during her freshman year that she met George. George was a typical wealthy jock, but the two hit it off immediately. They had a lot in common, from their families to their educations and their passion for sport. But they also had their differences. George was a big drinker. Drinker. He just loved to party, but Yardley was not so much. About a year into their relationship, Yardley started having second thoughts. In 2009, one of George's teammates walked Yardley home one evening. This was just an innocent occurrence, but George couldn't get it out of his mind that the two might have kissed. This was despite them both repeatedly denying it. One night, George broke into the teammate's home, and there he attacked him viciously whilst he was sleeping. Eventually though, the boys talked it out, and the next day they assured their coach that everything was fine. A few months later, in the spring of 2010, both Yardley and George's teams won their games, so they obviously celebrated with a party. During this, for some reason, George jumped on top of Yardley and started choking her. He was so violent towards her that her friends had to physically rescue her, and then that evening they drove her home to Baltimore, and that is when she told her friends that their relationship was over. Yardley was done with George's aggressiveness, with his impulsiveness and his total lack of empathy. Yardley was done. On May the 1st, 2010, George's team won the final game of the season. There was a celebration party and everyone was there. This included Yardley. Following the breakup, George didn't speak to her very much, but he would join in conversations every now and then, and everything looked normal from afar. But in reality, nothing about this situation was normal at all. The party wound down and Yardley went home. At 2.15am, her roommate returned to their off-campus home. Strangely, it appeared as though someone had broken into Yardley's bedroom. As the friend entered the room, she saw her sleeping in a very strange position on the bed. Just how drunk could she be, she thought. The friend went to wake Yardley up, but she realised something was very wrong. She had a red substance mixed in with her hair. Her right eye had been blackened. And as hard as the friend shook her, Yardley just wouldn't wake up. 
Now terrified, the roommate called 911. She told the operator that her roommate must have suffered an alcohol overdose. She didn't know how Yardley had gotten into this state, but she also couldn't fathom that someone would do this to her. When the paramedics arrived on the scene, they did everything they could to revive Yardley. But it was simply too late. At 2.47am, Yardley Love was pronounced dead. Six minutes later, homicide investigator Lisa Reeves arrived at the scene. By 4am, she already had her person of interest. All that Lisa needed to do was talk to the people who knew Yardley to truly understand her relationship with George. Nobody knew what their last conversation was about or when it had taken place, but Yardley's friends knew that she'd been trying to leave for a while. But still, she kept going back to George, and George never changed his violent behaviour. Everybody watched the relationship, and people were really troubled by it, but nobody knew what they could do to change things. Yardley had ended their relationship for the last time just nine days before her murder. Lisa knew that she needed to speak to George before sunrise. George Wesley Hughley V was born on September the 17th, 1987 in Washington, D.C. His father was the heir to a fortune, and George was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, so to speak. He went from private school to an all-boys high school. There he became an All-American lacrosse player and a quarterback for the school's football team. When he enrolled at the University of Virginia, he joined their lacrosse team, but within just one one semester, he had become the class clown. He just wasn't taking anything seriously anymore. In 2008, he was arrested for stumbling drunk into a busy road. When an officer told him to get a ride home, unless he wanted to come to the police station, he shouted bigoted and discriminatory comments at her, and then he screamed, I'll kill you. I'll kill all of you. I'm not going to jail. He became more aggressive, more physical toward me, started calling me several other um, terms that I'm not going to state now. Officer R.L. Moss with the Lexington Police Department had to use a taser on Hughley. He ended up being tasered and driven to the police station. There, with his parents' cash, he bought himself a lawyer. The lawyer stated he was too drunk to remember insulting the police officer. However, afterwards at school, he would brag left, right and centre about the incident, quoting every nasty little detail. Somehow he managed to not get expelled. Perhaps if he did, he never would have met. Yardley love. Lisa knocked at George's door just minutes away from Yardley's apartment. She was dressed in civilian clothing and said nothing about Yardley's death. She told George that she was conducting an investigation and she thought that he would be useful. Therefore, she invited him to the sheriff's office. George came willingly, but he did put on a show for being woken up so early in the morning. Inside of the car, Lisa noticed scratches and bruises on George's hands. This confirmed further that he was the main suspect. So when the interrogation began, Lisa cut to the chase. <clears throat> Just so you know, um, I don't have any arrest warrants for you, okay? okay? However, I am investigating a case, all right, and you are being detained, which means right now you're not free to leave, okay? okay. So I want to talk to you about this to find right. out, you know, so what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Does that right. make hat sense, you. Steve? Yeah. So before I can even, I want to talk to you, I want to make sure you do understand your rights, okay? And that way I can explain to you what's going on and all that good stuff. Do you understand, okay. you understand yes. that? Okay. Today's date is May the 3rd, 2010. All right, your first name is George. Yes. G-E-R-R-G. And your middle name? Is Wesley. How do you spell that? W E S L E Y. And spelling of your last name? H U G U G U B U E L Y. I've already told you who I am, Lisa Reeves, and this is Ed Pratter. He is also a detective at the Stars Police Department. Oh, All right. 
what I might do, I might take a little few notes here and stuff as That's I'm fine. talking to you. And... Lisa cleverly and quickly built a rapport with George. She made him feel safe being in the room with her. Before long, he signed the Miranda rights and started talking with no lawyer present. George explained that he had gone to the bar that evening for the party before going over to talk to Yardley. <coughs> Just so you know, um, I don't have any arrest warrants for you, okay? okay? However, I am investigating a case, all right, and right. you are being detained, which means right now you're not free to leave, okay? okay? So I want to talk to you about this to find right. out, you know, so what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Does that right. make that sense, Steve? Yeah. So before I can even, I want to talk to you, I want to make sure you do understand your rights, okay? And that way I can explain to you what's going on and all that good stuff. Do you okay. understand? You understand yes. that? Okay. Today's date is May the 3rd, 2010. All right, your first name is George. Yes. G-E-O-R-G. And your middle name? Is Wesley. How do you spell that? W-E-S-L-E-Y. And spelling of your last name? H-U-G-U. G-U-E-L-Y. I've already told you who I am, Lisa Reeves, and this is Ed Pratcher. He's also a detective at Stars Police Department. Okay. All right. What I might do, I might take a little few notes here and stuff as That's I'm fine. talking to you. And... I drank a few beers. When, like, I had, um, I went to the bar for a little while. I went to Boyle, Which bar? Boyle Heights. Oh, okay. Um, then I went over to talk to Yardley. And Who's when, Yardley? Yardley what, is my former girlfriend. Okay. Which this whole thing's about, which I understand. But when I went over to talk to Yardley, I I like was like Yardley, and she was like already f like totally freaked out because because of what she did this past like a few days ago, and she we hadn't talked since. And I was just gonna go talk to her. Mm -hmm. And she was already like, oh, like freaking out. He referred to her as his former girlfriend. He said he'd found out that Yardley had slept with a lacrosse teammate of George's just a few days before, and he wasn't happy. They had already broken up by this point, but this still didn't sit well with George at all. She started being like, like you know, like getting like all like aggressive after this and so i was like all right like chill out like and shook her a little bit and she started being like like freaking out and i was like listen i'm not like here to do anything i'm here to talk to you about everything that's ensued in the past week and and she was like and like sort of like being like no 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 like, like hitting her head like st like stop like like she's in the corner i was yelling about i was like stop like I was like, we were like, what the hell? Like, we were just going to talk. And, like, it was not at all, like, a good conversation because that's, like, she was already, like, freaking out with just even seeing me. Just even seeing me there. So what happened next? What happened next? And she was, just kept hitting her head against the, against the wall while she was sitting on the bed. And I was like... I grabbed her and I like shook her. I was like, "Stop!" Like we need to, like and looked at her. I was like, "We need to like talk about this." And, like, I mean, I was on holding her arm and stuff, but like I I never struck her. I never like hit her, hit her like in the face or anything. I was just like, "We need to talk." And she was so like, she was so like, oh, I mean, what's the word? Like you know, like like flopping a fish out of the water. Like like so like all this. All because of what happened last week, and I was like, "Listen, like, I'm not here to like fight with you or like do anything. Like, I'm here to talk to you." And like, and she's like, no, "No, no, like, get away from me!" All this like, and being and like, and like, that's what happened. And, like, I left. Like, she was in her bed. I think her nose was bleeding a little bit, but she was in her like when I left. She was like still in her bed. Like, I mean, I somehow we ended up. Somehow I was resting on her on the floor, and I was just like, stop, I just, like, and I was holding her, but I was never, I never struck her or anything, and I think that might have been when her nose started to bleed, actually, it was when I was holding her on the floor, being like, listen, like, I'm, like, you came intact with that, like, I wanted to talk to her about 
you know, everything because I got only like whatever, like text messages to like from her and all this stuff. And so that's when I was like holding her, but not so, like not like forcefully. And then and then you know she, then I guess that's when her nose might start to bleed. Was when like it, it like it like rolled like that, like her face on the ground and her nose started bleeding and. Then, and then the conversation I could tell was just like, it was not going anywhere and nothing was happening. No amount of years of prestigious schools taught George to be cautious or carefully construct his sentences. He implicated himself as a trespasser and as an attacker, all whilst thinking that he was justifying himself in the situation, claiming his innocence. Now Lisa could start adding pressure onto George, leading him to contradict his previous statements, and she drew him into a corner for a full confession. George claimed that he stepped easily into her house as the front door was open. Then he said he walked into her bedroom too as her door was unlocked. This obviously contradicts the signs of a break-in at the scene. He went on to confess kicking open her locked bedroom door. Her front door was open, her room door was closed, I knocked like... Like, you already, like, she heard me open the door and, and went in. All right. Went in where? To her room. All right, straight to her bedroom? Straight to her bedroom, yeah, I mean. How'd you get through the door? Her door or the mm -hmm. front door? Her door. Actually, it might have been locked. Mm-hmm. It was. Yeah, it might, yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. Just, just be honest with you. Yeah, no, yeah, it was actually it was locked, yeah. Because yeah. I think I put a hole. Yeah. You punched door. a hole through the door. Pretty sure, actually. Now, yeah, that okay. you said that, yeah. All right. Pretty what, sure. What, why'd you do that? Because I won't talk to her. Because mm -hmm. like, she sent been sending me like emails. Was she like, telling you to leave emails. or? She well, talk I, to I you? guess what she yeah. When I once I was in her room. She was like very like you know like or like da, 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 not like I don't want to talk to you like all the stuff like you know. Da, da, da. What was she wearing? She was what was she wearing? She I think she she was in her bed. She was in her underwear and t-shirt. Okay. Okay. We were like wrestling and we stood up and I I tossed her I pushed her onto the bed. I was like go to bed like I'll talk to you later. I put I, yeah I'm like. I didn't like throw her, but like mm -hmm. we were like standing up at this point after we were resting on the ground. She had like a bloody nose. Mm -hmm. And I was like, go, you, uh, go to bed. Okay. And you kind of tossed her on the bed and you left? Yeah. Okay. Did, um, did you go back and check on her at any point? No, I did not. Okay. Did you, uh, uh, did you touch her neck area at all? Did you choke her at one point? Um, I may have grabbed her a little bit by the neck mm -hmm. when we were like but i never like strangled her okay um okay. but i yeah i mean during the whole like commotion you know like i we may have i might have grabbed her neck but i never was never was like strangling her okay all right all right um i'm gonna go check on something really quick and i'll be right back okay, okay. He said the bruising on his hands was from lacrosse. When asked why they broke up, he said it was because they were from different areas and had different plans for the future. He never mentioned that his alcohol or violence issues were the reasons that Yardley had left. He also admitted that he took her laptop when he left her apartment. I'm sorry, my phone was going off and I had to take that call. I really apologize. I know you got to use my phone one second. I just want to kind of make sure whenever there's anything I wanted to talk to you about. Um, right. Was anybody else there? Just the two of you? No, our roommates weren't there, actually. Okay. Excuse me. Um, okay. Did when, when you left her apartment, did you take anything with you? No, Nothing she's at all. in her bed. All right, all right. Because um, I, I think we're not, her, her laptop is missing, I guess. Did you grab it for any reason? Uh, yeah, I did, actually. You did? Okay. Is it at your apartment? 
Yeah, okay. somewhere in my apartment. I can okay. give it to her. Why'd apartment. you grab her laptop? Because I was so pissed that she wouldn't talk to me. I was like, I don't know. I like took it almost as like collateral, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's it's not reasonable logic, but right. Okay. I don't know. Did you take anything else besides no, the laptop? No. Nothing. No. Okay. I mean. All right. So when uh, when you left out of there, I mean, you saw that she was bleeding on her nose. Did mm -hmm. Did you try to call rescue or anything? Make sure she's all right. No, I did not. No. Why? Uh I didn't think it was like in I didn't think that she was like in need of like going to the emergency room. I she just got I made a play. Why do you think that? I don't know. I mean I, I did did you say when you were and correct me if I'm wrong, when you were shaking her, her head was hitting the wall? Well, that was in the beginning. That was in initially when I walked in, like she was like up in the corner, like saying, get like get out of here, like you know, like this. Mm -hmm. Like, at, at any time when you were shaking her, did her head bang the, the wall? Did, did you like I mean, shake her into the wall? I know you already said you didn't punch her and stuff. And, no, and I mean, I wasn't like, like throwing her into the wall. Like, I mean, we were sitting on her bed, which is against the wall. And I was mm -hmm. like, like, and I was like, like, you're like, and like, I mean, maybe like I wasn't hitting her against the wall, but like, when she's uh, like sitting there in the corner mm -hmm. of like, if it were like, or like, like this, and I'm like, you're already like, you know, and I, I was like, 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 what the fuck was that about? Like, that, that's such bullshit that you like do that. Like, you know, I mean, possibly, I was like, you know, that, that's such a like bullshit move. Like, what, would, would, like, you know, like, ever like hitting her, like, what are you like doing? Like, like that, like. Okay. She, she has a pretty good knot on her head. That's why I'm asking. How that how how you can explain how that would have happened? I mean, I don't even know when that a knot. Mm -hmm. I mean, like on on the side of her head, she's been hit pretty good right there. So I'm just trying to figure out: Did you hit her with something? No, was that no, I never, I never, never touched her, or struck her, or anything. Well, you touched her. You had your hands on. You no, know, I yeah, no, I, I said never struck her. Okay. Never, never, never at all, like. Well, I'm, I'm trying I'm to figure out why, why she's got a black eye and why she's got a big lump right there. I mean, we were, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how. Is that what you're saying? You, you never I, Yeah, I don't know how. With anything. So she's got them. So, okay. Okay. Yeah, All right. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. All right. Um, Throughout his teenage and adult life, his violent drunken outbursts were protected by his family, his friends, or his lawyers. But this time, he was alone. Did you want to continue to talk to him a little bit? You know some stuff? Yeah, we'll talk to him real quick. All right. I'm gonna pull on your phone right there. We don't allow anybody to use our phones in here, okay? All right, good enough. Well, I have to tell you something. She's dead. You killed her, George. You killed her. She's dead? I think you knew that already. No, I did not. She's dead? How the fuck is she dead? Because you killed her, George. How the fuck is she dead? Because you killed her. Oh my god. We're not here for any reason, George. She's dead? Yes. She's dead? Yes. She's dead. She's dead. How? How? I already told you how. You already told us how as well. How is she dead? You just told us. How is she dead? How is she dead? I didn't triangle. I didn't do. I, I didn't fucking hit her. How the fuck is she dead? She, oh. I don't even know. I don't. She's dead. Yes. How the fuck is she dead? 
Oh my god. We're serious, George. On May the 2nd, 2010, George was handcuffed and charged with murder. Just, just for, out of protocol, what we gotta do is stand up for you. Put your hands behind your back. Turn around. Relax. Relax. You'll be alright. Tell me she's not dead. Tell me she's not dead, though, please. You're gonna have to be lying to me. Tell me you're lying to me. Tell me you're lying to me. How is she dead? I'm not lying. How is she dead? How? What did she die from? Well, we're gonna find that out. What did she die from? We're gonna, we're gonna find out. I can't make that determination. Sir, sir. E either the head trauma or asphyxiation. It, well, it, there was no asphyxiation. Okay. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. You just came in and said you were a final assault charge, which makes sense, but that doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. Lay! Still lay! When he finally relaxed and reality kicked in, he asked the multi million dollar question Okay, what do I do now? George went on trial on February the 6th, 2012. During his trial, the prosecution presented their case. On that fateful day, George had joined his father and a few friends for a round of golf at the Wintergreen Resort. His roommate said he had seen him drinking beer at 10am and that he was starting to get a little bit drunk. He went for dinner with family members and then he continued to drink beers in his apartment. By 11pm, the roommate said that he was now really drunk. When he walked into Yardley's apartment sometime after 11.15pm, she was alone in her bedroom. George then kicked in the bedroom door. A fourth year biology student who lived in the apartment below testified to hearing arguing and loud banging. And then she heard silence. The prosecution deduced that there was a verbal and physical altercation, an altercation in which he slammed her into the wall and shoved her onto her bed. This altercation caused blunt force trauma that eventually ended the life of Yardley. He then took her laptop and walked out of her bedroom through the apartment and down the steps to 14th Street where he threw her laptop in a dumpster. When this laptop was recovered, they found email correspondence between the two. George had been threatening her in the days prior. He was trying to act like the victim of a cheating girlfriend, but detectives found that on the day of the murder, he was openly flirting with three women on his phone. In other words, he had a very bad case of double standards. Several of his close friends would testify against him. They confirmed that he regularly behaved drunkenly and violently. George's lacrosse teammates testified to witnessing George strangling Yardley just months before her murder and attacking his teammate in his own bed. During the trial, a tragic twist was revealed. One medical expert revealed in the courtroom that following Yardley Love's brutal beating, had George or anyone else called for help, she may well have survived. Yardley lived for two whole hours before succumbing to the head trauma. Had George called an ambulance, Yardley could well still be alive today. George's defence attorney only had one argument. This was that George never went to Yardley's place with the intent to kill. It was simply a tragic accident that made a reality through his alcohol consumption. They also argued that George wasn't aware of any fatal injury until he was interrogated. However, this story didn't work with the jury. George Hughley V was found guilty of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 26 years behind bars. 
George's lawyer pleaded for the sentence to be halved. The judge, like the jury, was having none of it. However, he did reduce it minimally to just 23 years. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. And remember, if you appreciate what I'm doing here, please do hit that like button. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.